Okay. Well, let's get started. Uh, welcome to everybody who has joined or is joining uh, our webinar today. Uh, my name is Robert Bond and I'm a partner with Bristos and we're delighted to be hosting this uh, webinar, uh, the data protection impact assessments, who, what, where, when, why and how and so on. Um, you can see my bio on the screen, but just before we move on to our other speakers, uh, a little bit of admin. Uh, we were planning to spend about an hour on the webinar. Um, we are also uh, intending to record this webinar and the recording will be available uh, in well, probably five days just after Easter on uh, the cookie jar section of the Bristow's website. Uh, do use the question box to send questions in. I see that we've already had one uh, as to whether this will be interactive or um, you will be on mute. And the answer is um, you're on mute. Um, and if you've got questions, do use the question box and I'll pick those questions up uh, at either the end or if they are appropriate uh, at the time that uh, our panellists are speaking. Uh, our panellists should have included Dominic Batchelor, uh, the IP and Data Protection Compliance uh, Manager at Royal Mail, but unfortunately, Dominic. Um, is unable to attend today because um, in the current circumstances of business commitments. Uh, so you've got me. Uh, and then if we could move to the next slide, please, Nalisha. Uh, Stephen Bagri, Managing Council IT Procurement and Privacy at Balfour Beatty. Um, Stephen is a solicitor and managing council. Uh, he has worked closely with the Balfour Beatus Group Data Protection Officer, uh, is actively involved in the data protection network uh, as um, I am, and indeed as is our next speaker. Uh, next slide, please. Simon Blanchard, who's the Deputy Chair of the Data Protection Network uh, and uh, has many years experience in particularly the marketing uh, sector or, or interface between marketing and data protection. Uh, and we did want today to look at data protection impact assessments in the area of marketing, uh, but we're well aware that they are used in many, many other areas. And some of the questions that we've had in, in advance of this webinar do touch upon some interesting occasions where DPIAs may be used, including the current uh, pandemic. Uh, so without further ado, I'm now going to hand back to Simon uh, to take us through the next sections of the webinar. Simon. Thank you very much, Robert. Hi, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, yeah, so the topic for the day, um, data protection impact assessments. I think it is, as Robert said, something that is rather topical, particularly on the on the marketing side, but also for uh, for businesses looking at all sorts of other kinds of processing where uh, uh, an assessment has to be done of the uh, of the processing that's taking place. So uh, yeah, something I think that's important we find for an awful lot of clients, lots of questions in this area. So it's uh, it's a pleasure to be able to bring you the uh, the webinar today to talk through it. Right, so we're going to go through this in kind of an order of, um, as we said, I think in the intro, we're going to talk kind of through the, the what is a DPIA? Why do you need them? Uh, when would you need them? Um, who should be involved? And particularly important, I think, is how do you go about it? How do you go about conducting the DPIA? So let's start first of all with, with what is what is a DPIA? So as it says here, um, it's a management tool um, really to help the organization to, to be able to identify um, and to also to assess and minimize kind of any privacy risks that might be involved in your processing. Uh, when you're in, and it can be when you're implementing new systems, new technologies, new processes. Um, very much the focus is on personal data. 
Uh, so being able to identify where uh, data that will identify an individual or from which an individual might be identified. And I think it's important from the point of view of just thinking that it's not just PII, something that we often see is just PII. It's the broader definition um, of data under GDPR, uh, broader definition of personal data under GDPR. So we should be thinking about anything that could be used to identify an individual. Also important that you can uh, to enable you to review uh, the measures and controls that are in place to protect that personal data, just to make sure that the controls that you do have in place are adequate in light of any risks that you identify uh, during the process. It's important to carry one out at an early stages of a project. Of course, if you can become aware of them at an early stage, if you can become aware of the uh, of the project at an early stage and identify that a DPI is required. Um, and it's much like you would want to do in the information security environment. Uh, so if you've got an information security team involved that are wanting to understand if there might be any risks around things like data breaches uh, or unauthorized access to personal data. Um, so that's, I think, important too, to consider how DPIA might work in line um, with or in parallel with the information security requirements of assessing a project. Uh, DPIAs can be used to assess the privacy impacts also of continued use of existing systems. So it's not just for any new processing. You might want to retrospectively go back and look at existing processing that you've already been doing for some time and looking at it afresh if you've not conducted a DPI on that before. Uh, and it's a process that's really aimed at identifying uh, the risks and thereby to identify kind of any solutions that you might wish to put in place to make sure that you've got kind of adequate measures and controls in place to protect that data. And I think it just has to be emphasized that it's not a, it's not a box ticking exercise. Um, it's far more than that. It's really about trying to, um, you know, to get beneath the surface and understand what the risk profile looks like and to be able to identify uh, what solutions might be appropriate. Um, Stephen, was there anything you wanted to add to that or Robert? Um, I was just going to add that, um, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, pleasure to be here. Um, I, I was just going to add, it's probably worth noting that um, privacy impact assessments um, prior to GDPR did exist. So, um, in terms of the historic context, you know, they, this is, they weren't mandated, but they they were a best practice. So, I think with the what, one of the challenges has been for organisations has been that because um, PIAs were sort of very much you know an exception rather than the rule um there's not that awareness in the organizations when gdpr hit so dealing with that challenge um it is has been very pertinent over the last year um and i i mean i find it helpful to think of them as sort of multi-purpose um, tools in the sense that they're part questionnaire part risk assessment and mitigation plan and I guess I would just echo what you said in terms of um, not being a tick box exercise in that they're an iterative process and they need to be continually reviewed as your projects change. That's great, Stephen. I absolutely agree. I think that's an important part. They will, uh, they should become a, a living, breathing document that will, will grow over time as, again, more information becomes clear uh, about both the extent of the processing and the kind of measures and controls that the organisations put in place to protect the data. Um, Robert, was there anything you wanted to add on that? Uh, yes, Simon, thank you. I was also going to say I regard them as a good risk management tool or perhaps like a stop sign so that, you know, you might even just before you press the accept button on some new download, you know, it's, whoa, just before we do that, should we? And the answer, as we know, might well be, yes, we're still going to go ahead. But, it, you know, it, it is a, it's a very good risk tool, I think. Absolutely, yeah, quite agree. That's that's really got to be the aim of the of the the, the DPIAs to identify the risks. I'm sorry, Nalisha, I'm still having problems with uh, moving the slides. If you could move that on, please. Okay, so the next one is is why. Look at uh, you know why should we conduct them. Well, clearly there's a, there's a legal obligation uh, under GDPR. We have uh, Article 35 that talks about DPIAs um, and sets out some situations when a DPIA is required. Um, 
and therefore a, a, a DPI pro, you know, provides an organisation uh, to, to be able to demonstrate that it's met the mandatory requirements or gone above and beyond the kind of compliance requirements. So you don't only have to conduct DPIs where they are mandatory. Um, you could do them, I think, as uh, uh, as we've identified, you can do them in other situations to identify uh, what risks might be involved. So also from looking at it point of view of the, the individuals, what we're looking to do is to protect uh, the individuals whose data is being processed, be they employees, be they customers, be they anybody else whose data you're processing, uh, to ensure that people's rights are protected and upheld in line with GDPR and of course with other laws too. Uh, from a business perspective, we're looking at protecting the reputation of the organisation. Uh, the process helps to uh, kind of avoid any damage that we might have to brand reputation if things went wrong in the future, um, or if there might be any unforeseen uh, impacts of the processing. And to be able just to identify what kind of things could go wrong, what potential scenarios could we have so that we can identify um, any adverse impacts and to be able to protect against those. Um, I think as Robert's flagged up, uh, Robert's just said really, uh, it's very much an early warning system um, to be able to identify if there's, if there's anything that we should do to protect uh, the organisation and the individuals at the early stages uh, before anything happens. I think it's good to think about this, this concept of privacy first. Um, conducting a DPIA you know, very much does demonstrate to all of the stakeholders across the organization that you are taking privacy very seriously. And I think it's also worth mentioning that kind of, if you're linking it into the principles of privacy by design, uh, thinking about what your default privacy settings are and your default levels of protection that you're putting in place to protect individuals and protect their rights. And obviously coming out of it, once you've understood all of the processing and the risks that might be involved, it will enable you to properly inform your decision making to make sure that the right people are involved in making the right decisions to be able to protect uh, an individual's data. Um, can I ask maybe Stephen then uh, to comment on kind of the benefits that you see that an organisation uh, can get from conducting DPIAs? Yeah, sure. Um, so I think the purpose is on, on the one hand, helping evidence compliance with GDPR principles, uh, but on the other, a way of ensuring that where your organization carries out processing of personal data, you know, the, the impact on the individual's rights is, is properly taken into account. And, you know, as you say, it, it goes hand in hand with complying with privacy by default and design. I think the actual exercise of doing a DPIA helps enormously in, in, in that part. Um, but I think as well as basic compliance with, with um, GDPR obligations, the, the benefits um, of doing a DPI correctly um, are broader than that in, in that you know, often the processing activity is linked to a, an underlying business activity or uh, procurement exercise or IT system. And actually going through that rigour usually results in a more efficient process being implemented or, or better decisions being made um, you know if you've got activities that have commercial risks and of operational risks as well uh, as, as privacy risks then actually going through that exercise along with relevant stakeholders like your infosec team can flush out issues and it, it can mean that projects that perhaps shouldn't go ahead don't go ahead and um, or ones that there is merit in proceeding with you, you're able to adapt accordingly yeah, absolutely. I think it can it can really help drive out the the, you know, the information that you need to be able to make those decisions. Great. Uh, and Robert, anything you wanted to add on this one? Not on this one, but just to warn you, we've got some really good questions coming in, which um, I'll get to a bit later on. Great stuff. OK, we'll make sure to save some good time for questions then. Uh, can we move on to the next slide, please? So the next slide is when. Yes, when do we need to do a DPIA? Well, they are mandatory in certain situations. Um, so as it says on the screen here, when conducting a systematic and extensive evaluation of personal aspects of natural persons, which based on automated processing, including profiling, and on which decisions are based that produce legal effects on the individual or similarly affect the individual. So that's one scenario. Processing on a large scale of special category data or data that relates to uh, criminal offences, or systematic monitoring of publicly accessible areas on a large scale. 
Now, it's important to note that the data protection authorities, including our own ICO, have published lists of when a DPIA is or is not required. And I think, to be honest, if you look at kind of the wording that's used here, you know, very, you know the formal wording that's been provided, it isn't, to be honest, particularly enlightening. Um, so fortunately, we have another slide for you that I think brings it all to life in a more visual representation for you. So if we just move on to the next slide, I think that brings together, brings it out, hopefully, when the DPIA is required. So let's just work round the clock on these, starting uh, at the top, uh, the top uh, where the number one would be. Um, so large-scale processing that's of a lar particularly large scale. Uh, data transfers across borders, so uh, if you're transferring data outside of the EU. Uh, if you're conducting kind of automated decision-making about individuals, you're making some decisions that could have a, a legal effect or a similarly significant effect on that individual. Uh, any processing that might or could prevent an individual uh, from exercising their legal rights um, or, to, or from using a service or from entering into a contract. Any systematic monitoring that you might do of individuals. Uh, any use of new or innovative technologies or solutions. Matching or combining data sets, which is certainly from my point of view something that I see quite regularly when, when uh, organizations are bringing in uh, new systems or wishing to combine data sets together to gain new intelligence. When you're processing data of children or of vulnerable people. Uh, special category or criminal data. And finally, evaluation and scoring of individuals when you're conducting those. So lots of different scenarios, and I think that's probably a lot more enlightening to understand the kinds of things. You can see the breadth uh, of different kinds of processing that might actually uh, have an impact on individuals um, and require you to conduct a DPIA. Um, can I come to, to Robert and to Stephen? Well, let's start with Robert and to think uh, and maybe to say some examples uh, that you've come across of these. Well, actually, just before we do, there's... there's um... There's one or two questions which are pertinent to, to where we are at. So I'll just put right. them out there. I'll put them out there for the three of us to answer. Now, the first one, um, in the slide where we talk about the mandatory requirements, including large scale uh, monitoring, one of the questions is, is there any way of defining what is large scale? Simon? I think that's quite a challenging one, to be honest, and I think it comes down to the individual um, data protection authorities in terms of how they've defined it, um, in terms of what, what large scale means, because it could you have to also take account in terms of the types of data. So large scale could be what might be considered large if you're handling very, very sensitive special category data, for example. Uh, you might not need such, uh, such large volumes, uh, whereas if it's low sensitive data, um, it could be, you, know, you might need a much larger volume for it to kind of meet a threshold. So I think it, it does come down to those kind of guidance and thinking about the sensitivity of the data. Stephen, was there anything you want to add to that? Um, yeah, I'd agree with that. I, th I think you need to you need to take into account the ICO guidance on it, but also I, I think you do need to make it because not everything is spelt out in all of the guidance. So there are there are things that you need to make a judgment call on as an organization and, and also taking into account the number of DPIs you are going to be doing and you know it, so that you can set the parameters correctly and, and and it's also the type of processing you do as as a company um in, in setting that at the right level okay and um just before we move on um there's a question which I'll just quickly answer and then one more, I think, for um, you, Stephen and Simon. Um, we've got a question. Uh, is a data protection impact assessment the same as a privacy impact assessment or is a PIA smaller? And the answer is, is and Stephen was talking about this earlier, privacy impact assessments were in use before GDPR when in effect they became, the terminology became data protection impact assessment, but the principles have been one and the same. Uh, and then the other question, which I'll start with you, uh, Simon, because I know it's dear to your heart. What is the common ground between a data protection impact assessment and say a legitimate interest assessment? 
Yeah, that's a good point, Robert. Um, so quite often when you start to assess some processing, um, you don't always know what the lawful basis is going to be um, at the very start and when, when you engage. So an organisation may go down the, uh, the DPIA route uh, and then decide that it might be appropriate to conduct uh, legitimate interests. So the purpose really for a legitimate interest assessment, which is just you know, slightly different to a DPIA, is to very much look at it from the point of view of the legitimate interest lawful basis. Uh, which is very much that focus again. It's very similar, really. It's the focus on on individuals' rights and freedoms, uh, which under legitimate interest, you have to take account of those and to be able to balance and conduct the balancing test um, for legitimate interest that identifies the, uh, the interests of the controller, but the rights and freedoms of the individual and it really is more focused towards uh, that balance test. So I think they're quite similar. Uh, but uh, a legitimate interest assessment is very much just geared to that lawful basis, which you may or may not know um, at the start of the task. And that's, that's part of the challenge. If you can quite clearly identify that it's uh, uh, that you're, you're going to be working, you're going to be using the lawful basis of legitimate interest, you may well choose to go down the, the LIA route so that the, uh, the assessment is much more geared to, to meeting that lawful basis. Hey, and sorry to land one more before we move on, but again, it's relevant to those mandatory requirements. But um, what is it, do you think, wise to use a DPIA where we are using CCTV in a private company's manufacturing plant? What do you think, guys? I mean, I would I would normally recommend doing a DPIA for CCTV activity that you're controlling as a company. It may be different if you're you know if you're doing it as a processor for another another company that's controlling it. But certainly, where where you're in control of the CCTV operations, um, uh, you know, we we would generally take the view that we would class that as high risk and try to do a DPIA on it just because there's a multitude of issues with it and it might be different if you have a you know you should really also have an established policy on how you do your cctv um which i know is part of the the code of practice on that um but certainly i would recommend doing one and that, that our approach at for bt is we would regard that as something we would normally do a, a dpia on yeah i totally agree stephen it's something that i've come across a few times as well um, about the need to need to conduct a DPIA because you need to consider all sorts of things like you know how long is appropriate to retain the data, uh, the impact on individuals' rights uh, from the point that their, their image may be captured on the CCTV. And I think it's also probably worth mentioning one other scenario that kind of is not CCTV but another use of cameras, uh, dash cams um, and cameras fitted to vehicles. Uh, that's something that I've seen growing quite a bit as well. The the use of those and again I'd highlight the fact that you've certainly want to be considering uh, if you're if you're conducting if you're using dash cams uh, considering doing a data protection impact assessment for those two okay Simon should we carry on yeah should we move on to the next slide please so we're going to look a little bit now at the, the marketing activities, uh, where you need a DPIA for marketing activities. And this really comes from the ICO's draft marketing code, uh, which came out in January this year. And let's look at a few examples that were picked out in that uh, in the draft marketing code. So again, it talks about large scale, uh, large scale profiling of individuals. Uh, data matching, which I think we saw on a previous slide, but particularly data matching where it's used in a direct marketing context, which is quite a common theme, I think, uh, particularly nowadays in direct marketing solutions where one data set is matched with another data set and therefore additional um, intelligence can be gained from that. Uh, that's an example that would, uh, according to the ICO, would now require a data protection impact assessment. Uh, where there's any invisible processing, and this is a term that the ICO uses quite a lot, invisible as in that the, the individual whose data is being processed might not be aware of it, uh, where you've gathered data from a list broker, uh, where you've been doing some online tracking, um, and particularly where that online tracking is done by third parties, maybe using cookies, uh, online advertising, particularly behavioral advertising, uh, reuse of publicly available data. So there's, there's various scenarios there that the individual might not be aware of how their data is being processed and the parties that may be involved in that. So those would be scenarios. 
Um, also, uh, they put about tracking of geolocation um, or the behavior of individuals. Again, it's the kind of thing that's, uh, that comes up in ad tech, um, online advertising, uh, cross device tracking, all of those kind of things too, wealth screening. Um, and also targeting children um, or more other vulnerable individuals. Yeah, and again, for marketing purposes or for profiling and where profiling is used for marketing purposes. Uh, I think that last one actually, uh, Robert, was one that you wanted to, to say something about, if I recall. Yeah, thank you, Simon. Well, it, it was really that um, not just for marketing, but obviously uh, children uh, from a GDPR point of view are a particular category that gets called out in terms of uh, the transparency and plain language of information you use when you engage with children. Uh, there's also uh, a not dissimilar issue where you are dealing with uh, vulnerable people uh, because you've got to adapt the way you're using the technology or you're gathering the information to the fact that vulnerable people may not be as easily able to comprehend what happens with their data and why. And I think back to my DPIAs are a risk management tool. I think wherever you sort of use that, hey, let's just stop one minute before we do this test, at least if you still decide to go ahead with it, you would have an audit trail that showed a regulator why you did not do what you did lightly. And the likelihood is that the DPIA will have moved you to put in place various checks and balances. Um, we may get back to this question later on, but of course, when we look at geolocation, that's precisely some of the issues that are coming up right now with COVID-19 and so on. But I think maybe we, we might get back to that later, Simon. Yeah, I think that's a good example, actually, Robert. Yes, a lot of organisations looking to use geolocation. Yeah, but for the moment, shall we move on to the, uh, to the next slide, please? So just thinking about who needs to be involved, uh, and I think, again, sometimes organisations may not realise the number of uh, uh, types of individuals that would need to be involved and uh, the different roles. So first of all, I, I guess, would be the, the data protection officer or the privacy team, somebody that's acting as a, a lead uh, in that area for the DPIA. Uh, but probably more widely, the legal team, uh, often a legal team are involved alongside a privacy team uh, or a compliance team. So you've got, the, you've got somebody that's acting in a legal capacity because there's often a contractual element involved in the DPIA if you're working with third parties. Um, stakeholders from the business function. I think it's really important to be thinking about, so who owns the accountability in your organization for the particular, particular types of processing? So again, let's take it if it's marketing processing, should the marketing director or individuals from the marketing team be involved? Uh, if, it's, uh, if it's of employee data, should somebody from the HR team be involved? I think the key thing is making sure that you've got the people that are accountable for that processing. And it's also important to remember that obviously they are usually the ones that are most, that are closest to the actual processing that's going on and will understand the types of issues that individuals could potentially face if something went wrong. Again, for larger technology projects, there's quite often a project manager that's involved in coordinating teams, coordinating people and working, making sure that the, uh, the DPA is conducted uh, in line with the timescales that the project is working to. Uh, on working closely with the, the CISO or information security team. So quite often I find when working with clients, there's somebody on the information security team that's looking very much alongside, uh, working alongside the privacy team, uh, looking at the information security side, looking at risks of breach, looking at unauthorized access to data, all of those kind of things. Um, and finally, any other stakeholders that might be involved, and I'm thinking here of things like third parties, again, if you're using third party processors, a new solution brought in from a third party, uh, you'll often need somebody on that side, or obviously maybe somebody on the IT side um, who would be familiar with the, who would be able to understand the way that the technology is working and be able to interpret the use of personal data and the controls that sit, uh, the technical controls that sit around that. Um, anything, guys, you want to add to this before I move on? Um, I mean, just in, to add, in, in terms of 
how we approach this on uh, Balfour BT, we uh, we sort of work in the way where we have a regular DPIA review with our DPO and InfoSec team involved as well. We find it's enormously helpful to be joined up with them on that um, in terms of how we approach DPIA reviews, um, because there's often a crossover with your InfoSec and supplier due diligence. So, you know, a lot of the information is similar. So you want to avoid duplication of effort as far as possible. Um, and there's also a tie-in in terms of assessment of the security risks. Um, we also have a governance framework, so with our, a steering board, uh, where we have an XCOM sponsor, um, our DPO, legal and relevant attendees from across the business. Um, that's for broader GDPR governance, but, but also it, we look at the stats of the DP, uh, DPIAs and look at trends and you know, if we've got areas of the business where we think we're not, we're, there's not enough DPOs, uh, DPIAs going on, then we can spot that. Um, and I think in terms of stakeholder groups, as you said, it, it really varies across the business. So, but there are super users that you can identify. You know, it might be in IT, HR, or procurement, or PMs, due to the nature of their roles. So, um, you can sort of target them for training. And I think, as you said, we've, we've found it essential that you've got to have the right people responding to the right sections, um, because the quality of your DPA really depends on the quality of the data. So engaging with, with the suppliers on pertinent points um, is also key. Absolutely right. I think that's an important thing, and we're, we're going to be talking a bit more, I think, a little later on about how we kind of engage with uh, with the different people that will be involved and the, the super users, project managers, and people like that. I think a little later on. Um, Thank you. If you don't mind. Jim, sorry, Simon. Just to jump in, uh, probably a question for Stephen, if it's okay now. I've just had in. Um, who should who should um, drive the DPIA? Is it the data protection officer that makes those decisions? Well, I think I think there's there's two aspects really. I, I mean, the way that the way that I would view it is the DPO should be the approver and the reviewer, um, and really the legwork around getting the information for the questions should should be led by the stakeholder that's that's leading the the processing activity right um but in reality that that is an ongoing challenge and i think a lot of organizations will find in practice the dpo is having to facilitate most of it and drive it forward um but i think that that it links into an awareness piece with with, with um, your stakeholders you, you want to get to a point where your stakeholders are actually driving the process that you need to give them the framework to do that um and i think um, uh, there's you know mature companies with a deep mature dpia process it will be almost self-service and the dpo will be obviously actively involved in reviewing it but the business will be well versed in in doing it and i think most companies probably aren't at that level yet so it's a it's kind of like a, a journey Thank you. Sorry, um, I have loads more questions, but I'm going to park them now so that we um, finish the slides. Over to you, Simon. Yeah, exactly. Um, let's move on to the next one, please. So we're going to now talk through kind of the overall process of a DPIA, the how, the important bit, I think, about how we would go about it. Um, let's move straight on because we're going to go through these, uh, these steps one by one. So the first step is to identify if a DPIA is needed. Thank you. Um, so we need to be thinking about, so will personal data actually be processed? And if so, how are we going to process it? Um, let's look if it's absolutely necessary. So is there an alternative way to achieve the objectives without processing personal data? Is there another way that you can achieve your objectives? Um, so quite often processing can be done without actually using the personal data by anonymizing it and doing it. Uh, what choices will individuals have regarding the data? So thinking about their, their rights and the choices and being able to give the individuals the choices that they, they would like. Um, thinking about the rights of the individuals, including the right to not being notified, um, how, they're, how they're notified about the, the processing taking place and their rights to potentially to object to that processing. Thinking about the the how intrusive the technology is. So for example, some of the things that we were talking about on previous slides, are you using things like uh, location data, use of AI, what kind of outcomes are there going to be on the individuals of the, the processing that you uh, are doing? Is that processing proportionate to what your goals are? 
to what you're trying to do. Are you doing too much? Are you, you over-processing the data? And thinking about it very much from the point of view of uh, the requirements around uh, minimization and just, just using the data that you actually need to achieve the task. And then um, if you can, you might conclude, of course, that there is no DPIA necessary. Once you've looked at it, you might decide that actually it's, there's relatively low impacts on individuals or in fact that the, uh, the processing is clearly in line with what the, the individual would expect. Um, and the fact that there are, they're not high level of risk, there are low levels of risk, in which case you might conclude that you don't need to conduct a DPIA. Um, Stephen, if I can just come to you on this one, I, I understand that you use a pre-qualifying process um, to be able to identify if a DPI is required, because that's often part of the challenge, isn't it, is when should we do one and when shouldn't we? Could you maybe just say a few words about that? Yeah, so um, so we, we started off with a, with a manual tool, like I think most organisations probably did, but then when we realised the scale of the task um, when embarking on GDPR, um, we, we looked at investing in a, an online platform, and as, as part of that, you know, structuring that what that, what that tool and questionnaire looks like, um, we've included a sort of pre-DPIA qualifier, um, which is, is a sort of shorter series of questions, um, and it's basically to help determine what what we would conduct a full DPIA on, um, so that as far as possible, you know, we're spending time assessing the right types of activi activity um, and some of the triggers for that will be similar to, to some of the processing activities you've called out in one of the previous slides where, where it's um, types of high-risk activity where, where a DPA would, would be seen as mandatory so it could be automated decision making or profiling where you've got personal data being transferred outside the EEA for example um, and it and it really it, it helps because it means you're focusing your if it's done correctly you're focusing your attention on um, carrying out full DPAs on the right type of activity, um, but also you've actually got an audit trail of where you've made the decision that actually a full DPA is not required, but you've got some due diligence on uh, the questions you've asked. So from an audit perspective and regulatory perspective, it's it's enormously helpful. Yeah, I, I quite agree. Uh, in my experience, having some kind of uh, questionnaire-based approach, a pre-qualifier in some way can really help you to uh, to focus on the right things. I think that's it. It's about putting your, your resources behind uh, what potentially could have the biggest impact and to make sure that that's in line with the, the organization's uh, resources, capabilities, et cetera, and what the uh, the scale of the, the processing that they are, uh, they're aiming to deliver is. Should we just move on to the next slide? So the next bit is the, the key part is to describe the information flows to understand exactly what's going on. So this is kind of the, the how, what, when, as we've been talking about um, within some form of uh, template. And we'll talk hopefully about the, the different ways that you might be able to capture it or uh, templated or technology solutions a bit later on if we have time. Uh, but you'd want to be recording. So, so what data assets are actually being processed and particularly what personal data is being processed? Is there any special category data? Um, what's the nature of that kind of processing activity that you're undertaking? Uh, and what are the end purposes? Because there, there might just not just be just one purpose, there might be multiple purposes. So it might be marketing, it might be recruitment decisions, it could be all sorts of different things. Um, and particularly, I think, being able to, uh, have you identified the lawful basis? Uh, have you identified if you're processing as a result of a contract? Are you doing it um, under legitimate interests or under consent, et cetera? Um, or, or do you not know at the time that you are you're starting out on the journey? So that will need some thought because you'll need to make sure that you can comply with the, um, the relative um, you know, responsibilities and accountabilities that exist under the, each of those lawful bases, whichever one you, you choose. Um, thinking also about how the information will be obtained, how it's going to be used and how long you're going to retain it. That's often a question that people have not thought about is how long they're going to retain it for the specific purposes. Uh, being able to describe those data flows, uh, I find that uh, a picture can, again, as usual, paint a thousand words. It's really useful if you can get a schematic and a simple diagram that makes it very clear, because quite often there's there's more than one data system involved, and to be able to understand the flows of data can can really help you to uh, to get to grips and to understand what's going on. Uh, looking at how individuals are going to be notified of their rights. Uh, thinking about which rights apply, because again, in different scenarios, different rights may apply. 
uh, looking at whether new third parties are going to be involved. Uh, are you outsourcing to existing third parties? Are you bringing a process in-house? Uh, all of those kind of things, because there, there can be quite significant changes uh, that take place if uh, a new, new third party is appointed or if one, in fact, uh, you're moving it in-house. Different people involved, different processes. Uh, looking at uh, that potential for function creep, like there, there quite often can be with projects, I'm sure you've all experienced this, it starts out as one thing but, but metamorphosizes into something uh, potentially much bigger and that can often lead to kind of there being secondary purposes or secondary outcomes that may not have been anticipated from the start. Um, and just making sure that people then focus on the, uh, the practical implications uh, of that. Um, Robert, I'll come to you, is there anything you wanted to add on this one? No, long for me at the moment. Good with that. Great. Well, in the interest of time, we'll move on to the next one then, please. So this is about the identification of the privacy risks. I think once you've uh, identified exactly how the information is flowing, you've identified, you've understood your purposes, the lawful basis, you've understood the rights that apply, etc. you can then start to identify if there are any actual risks to the individuals, uh, including kind of risks around the intrusions of their privacy. Uh, looking at the laws that apply, the laws, regulations, it's not only GDPR that we're thinking of here, what other laws might apply. Uh, quite often other laws will apply depending on the types of processing that you're doing and to be able to think of it from the point of view of the, the risk to the individuals, but also any corporate risks or reputational risks that might be exposed through, uh, through the work that you're doing. Um, keeping a record, it's always really important to have a record of the risks, and it helps if you can find a way of benchmarking these, if you have an established risk matrix, uh, which would normally, uh, for example, include a scale of uh, the severity of the impact against the likelihood. Um, in terms of your risk matrix so that you can identify and, and actually calculate a, a relative risk score for this processing. And again, as part of that, you probably need to be thinking about, so, so what is our risk appetite? Um, and being able to identify, is the, the level of risk that's been identified within our organizational appetite for risk? And that's something that, again, from my perspective, quite often have those conversations with organizations. And there's not always a clear view on what is our risk appetite? What level of risk are we prepared to take? Um, but uh, you're, it's something that you really need to be thinking about and be thinking about how to benchmark the different risks of different, uh, different projects and activities. Um, Robert, is this one that you wanted to, uh, to comment on? The different kinds of risk perhaps that you might um, be looking for in projects? Um, well, a, a good example uh, recently uh, in the current COVID-19 was uh, a company who desperately need more staff um, wanting to know would it be a reasonable uh, approach to use the last two years former staff's telephone numbers to contact them to see if they wish to take up a job offer um, and when you think about would this be within the reasonable expectations of the individual to start a campaign like this um, you would have to do an assessment because there may be some members of staff who were bad leavers where receiving a phone call would only exacerbate situations where there would be other uh, people who have retired who might be more than happy to be coming back. So it's one of those where you work your way through uh, the privacy concerns and then try to reach um, enough checks and balances to feel you should go ahead or maybe you don't maybe the risks are too great just one example i think that's a really nice topical example yeah and just kind of identifies the kind of again the way that you'd approach it and the, the risk that could be involved should we just go on to go on to the next one i'm keen to make sure that we've covered everything and give people an opportunity to ask more questions uh, at the end um, so then it's about identifying the, the different solutions that might be appropriate to, uh, to either to eliminate, and we appreciate that you can't always eliminate all of the risks, 
Uh, quite often, there, there's still some level of, of residual risk after you tr seek to, to mitigate it. That will usually be the case. Uh, but to be uh, able to identify the different options that you have available, what the costs and the benefits of those options, maybe the resources that are involved, um, and to understand them to evaluate which is the best course of action. Or in fact, if no course of action is required, if you've identified that the, the risks are within the, uh, you know, there are a low level of risks and those are acceptable level of risk, you might choose to take no, no action um, in terms of the risks. So it's being able to understand all of those and to be able to then uh, document what you've decided. It's really important to have come to a decision uh, on which is the best way forward and which one you're going to adopt, mindful of the time, the costs and the resources that are involved. If we just move on to the next section. Thank you. Um, so recording the outcomes, this is going to be the key part at the end, is once you have identified all your options, you've made your decision, you've got to be able to record that onto uh, DPIA, onto whichever template or form that you've used, including being clear on what methodology you've used, what, what decisions you've taken, uh, what considerations you've had and what decisions you've taken and uh, you've, you've actually come up with in the end. You'll need to make sure that you record all of the actions that will be clearly documented with your owners, with your time scales. Again, as we said, this is not just a box ticking exercise. There needs to be an action plan that comes out the back of it that says, right, we're going to, this is the risk we've identified. This is what we're going to do about it. This is the person that's going to own it and it will be delivered by this date. I always encourage clients to think about any jargon that they might normally use. That it's this in any industry or any business, there's always certain, quite often the three-letter anachronisms, things like that, that everybody in the business knows, but or, or people in certain teams know, but other people who are coming to read this uh, at a later date might not understand what those terms mean. So I, I always say try and take a plain English approach, try and do it in a way that somebody else could read. For example, somebody from the ICO uh, could read if you needed to show this as evidence. Thinking then about who's going to sign it off, is that going to be your DPO, is it going to be the function head who has responsibility in your organisation for, for making the decision uh, on the risk and that you've, you've, you've done enough to be able to mitigate those risks um, and making sure that the report is available to stakeholders with very clear action plan. Um, anything you wanted to add to that guys? Um, I mean I was just going to comment on the fact if you're using a if you're using an online platform it is quite useful because you can you can flag specific risks on that and assign specific risk owners um, as stakeholders in the business. So it's quite a good way of tracking risks and um, you know assigning actual project actions to them. I think that's good because then you you'll have a, a flag system that that comes up and says, okay, it's reached that date now. Has that action taken place? Yeah. Uh, and also um, some of the solutions will link into risk registers. I think that's an important thing. You may have still have a residual level of risk or you may have identified something that there might be a longer term solution, something that we can do something about in a few months time, but we can't put a privacy solution in place immediately. Um, so you can link it into a risk register for a period of time again and software solutions can sometimes help you to do that too. So if we just move on to the next one, we're getting towards the end of our slides now. Uh, just being able to integrate the DPIA outcomes back, which is really what we've been talking about here, just making sure that this is an ongoing process um, that we've identified that you know we've we've tracked back and looked at the actions again afterwards. Have they been fully implemented? Uh, ensuring that this DPIA is a is a living document and uh, and that it's uh, that you're consulting with people throughout the life cycle. Because again. Uh, I don't know what you find, uh, guys, but I quite often find that there more and more nowadays there's proof of concepts. Um, so an organisation will carry out a proof of concept and you'll do an initial DPIA for the proof of concept, but then you'll need to come back to it, look at it again uh, and review it at the time that you wish to roll out because there might be additional decisions that need to be made at that time. So thinking about it as an ongoing living, breathing thing. And again, if you have a policy, uh, we'd encourage organisations to think about putting a DPIA policy in place. Again, it's part of providing guidance to the to the organisation and should link into uh, to your training um, across the organisation, making sure that the individuals that you want to uh, to take part in in DPIAs have got a handbook and a policy that they can refer to. If we just go on to the the next one here, monitoring. 
which I think we've pretty much covered here now, really, just being clear, not one off exercise and that we're going to be, be revisiting it and being ready to adapt to any changes, because um, particularly things might not always work out exactly how you anticipated. Uh, you need to loop back round with people a little bit afterwards and identify, well, have the outcomes actually worked out to be exactly what we uh, what we thought they were going to be? Are we happy with the level of risk that we now have? Has anything um, have we identified any new risks? Uh, so there might, for example, be in the, the early days that a project goes live, you might identify a new risk that you'd not thought about before. So being able to loop around and to be able to uh, to tackle it that way. Um, anything you wanted to add to that, uh, Robert or Stephen? Yeah, if I could just, again, practical example. Um, a couple of years ago, I had a client in the uh, life sciences sector where uh, on a cost saving basis, uh, part of the team in clinical trials were looking to outsource the hosting of patient data, etc. Um, and we ended up doing the DPIA going through all of the risk assessments and the balancing exercises. And actually, at the end of the day, the cost of putting in place the checks and balances to allow the outsourcing were three times as much as the current costs of running the program internally. So it, it, it was a definite, this is not going to happen. So, you know, a useful practical exercise. I equally... Um, have seen situations where uh, the DPO has been seen as the business prevention unit because they're constantly saying no, no, no. And in one case, I'm aware of a, a DPO being so conflicted that they uh, they left the business because they, they simply couldn't advocate uh, the particular project going ahead they left the business and it went ahead without them. Mm -hmm. and I, I mean, I, I think on that, because we see that, um, those kind of challenges as well on projects. And I, I think where it's it's helpful is to, it's really important to have a governance framework there because where you've got risks that are residual, even after the DPIA, you need some way of escalating that to your top management so that, you know, they can be acted on and um, because otherwise the perception is the DP team are the blocker. Um, so I think it, it's really important to just, you know, you do your DPIAs, but you don't just leave all the risks there. You, you have to be actively managing them. And um, if you've got that executive sponsor, um, you know, that it's, it's helping show the accountability piece as well. Yeah, I think that's true, Stephen, because quite a lot, sometimes you will like, you will come across risks that are not specific to the project, but are actually organisational or cultural risks um, that you're, that you, you know, you, you have it, you'll come up with each time you do a DPIA across different projects and it's important that those are recorded um, and that they are regularly reviewed and tackled. Okay, I think we are just about at the end of our presentation. So, um, Robert, do we want to go through any more questions? I think we've still got another five minutes or so to pick up some more of the questions, haven't we? Yeah, yeah. Um, I know we've got some questions in advance, but I'm just going to suggest, if I can, there were one or two that came in uh, that I'll throw out to you too. Um, if is using criminal conviction data, uh, I'm assuming as part of uh, background checks, is that a DPIA trigger, do you think, guys? Um, I, I, would, I would treat that as a trigger. I would expect that to be something um, we would do a DPIA on um, because it, it it's it's high risk data and um i think there's a lot of issues around that that process and it's something that you're under the dpa you're also expected to have a policy around so um i think the process that you use for that criminal um conviction check 
you know whether you're using a a supplier and and or you have a pro, standard process for it I, I would expect you to do a dpa for that yes okay and then i've got one i'm going to give to simon if that's okay simon can you this one um uh if, if you had a series of marketing campaigns that were similar in style could you do one dpia for all of those campaigns yes i think you could um i think providing that they've got enough in common that you could collectively review them um it would probably be an awful lot of you know duplication of effort to do to do one for every every different campaign um so certainly i've i've worked with the client on that basis whereby you do one that that looks at a broader scope of that marketing and looks at the common elements that are involved and then if there's any outliers to that which sometimes there can be some outliers where a certain campaign is a little different to the others and needs separate assessment that you just pick out you know the separate ones that might need a separate assessment but for but from the majority of it you can you can do that all within one assessment uh, and that can also apply where the organization's using legitimate interests as the basis for its marketing i think the same can be done within a within within an lia covering that okay and that's that's telepathy because that was the other part of the same question so great and then, <laughs> i guess it might be robert <laughs> and then um uh, there was another one which was uh, if in a corporate merger uh, data sets between the two parties are going to be merged should this trigger a dpia from the lawyer's point of view i would say uh, yes uh, i don't know whether stephen you've got any thoughts on that um i think it, it i i would say generally yes but i think there's a bit of analysis that, that you could do to just work out whether you whether you would definitely mandate that or not i, I think in most cases there's going to be a, a it's going to be large scale in terms of the amount of data you're talking about but i suppose if it was quite a small acquisition you might be able to take a view on it but i i think i suspect in most cases it would be yes yeah i would agree um and i can think of actually a specific example of this as well um where it can apply to you know mergers and acquisitions but also to divestments within a group uh that that is a situation that might require a dpia or a, a legitimate interest assessment um particularly that the two the two scenarios that i was very mindful of is is where there's employee data affected uh, where employees are, uh, are moving from one entity to another in those situations. Um, so you've got to consider the impact on employment data, but also marketing data and where you're merging marketing data sets and the impact that might have around permissions or, or risks if that data is not accurately combined with, uh, uh, you know, in terms of the way that the data has been merged together. So those things, again, I, I would, I would whole, wholeheartedly agree that a DPIA would be appropriate for that. Um sorry to just go on but there's a couple of other really interesting questions that have come in um so uh this one is specific to housing in the current crisis where the question is uh as a housing authority uh we want to contact tenants to check on their financial situation in the current climate uh, do you think this needs a DPIA because we are carrying out some sort of marketing communication or is this more of a service approach? And that's an interesting one. I don't know what, what your thoughts are, Simon. Yeah, um, that is an interesting one. Um, usually the conversations that I have, because uh, this comes up a bit with clients, is is being clear on what actually is service and which is marketing um is the is the main role that you're doing it for marketing purposes and i don't know in this specific case it sounds did i understand the question right i can't see the question i'm afraid robert do you say that marketing would be involved in this or that they're doing no, it no. primarily to serve their clients uh, it's a question as to whether um is the contact with the tenants something that is is marketing or is it service so it's they're not saying whether it, it is a marketing message they're raising the question they right. don't think it is and I, I would say i don't see that as marketing either 
I wouldn't have thought so in that situation. But that, that's the key thing is, is being very clear on what is the contract of service uh, and therefore what, what is acceptable within that contract. And if it's uh, something in, in the current situation around COVID, I would suggest that probably is service related. And therefore, yeah, and you, then, could, you could use a different lawful basis. And then the other one, the other one, which is COVID related, is if as an employer, we are um, gathering information about the health of our employees or visitors to the premises, uh, does the fact that that's health data trigger a need for a DPIA before we do it? My view would be that it would depend on the on the depth, uh, you know, the amount of information we're gathering. If we're if we're simply gathering information on whether somebody um, believes that they, you know, that they have had COVID or do have COVID, that's slightly different to if we're processing, you know, broadly processing health data and whether the key thing is, you know, whether it's strictly necessary to do so or not to protect other individuals. So I think in most cases, an organisation would want to do that where they, where they use the minimum amount of data and they used it specifically to protect other individuals, in which case that might not require an assessment. Um, but I think if there's any question around that, about whether it's uh, whether the processing has been you know, minimised to that level or whether you might be processing additional data that you may or may not need, then that's the kind of situation that you might want to, uh, uh, to, to use a DPIA. I don't know what you think, Stephen. Um, I'd agree with that because I think, I mean, one of the things is that when you when you look at these types of activities, um, actually doing the DPIA itself then uh, just gives you a better view of 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 answering that, uh, you know, because it's only until you've done the DPIA where you really know all the ins and outs of of the, of the risks, etc. Um, so I guess the challenge is just, you know, in the initial phase trying to work out whether whether you have to do a full one or not but um sometimes you yeah. just don't have enough information at that point and it's only doing the exercise that that gives you um that insight lovely so we're we're just about one hour from when we got started um i don't know whether there's any of the other questions you think worth raising Simon that you've got in front of you otherwise we'll probably be getting close to wrapping up because I can see people starting to uh, to drop off as we've reached the hour the only one that I saw a bit further up was was just somebody highlighting about ad tech again which I think is just one thing I wanted to, uh, yeah, to mention in the from the point of view that yeah it's been it's made pretty clear i think that organizations that are um you know that are involved in in real-time bidding for example um there's there's the issue around transparency there uh, and around provenance of the data and whether the individual knows what is what is actually happening around that data so those types of scenarios would be one i think that the ico is very much looking for an organization to carry out a dpia on okay and i i, I I know that um, one or two people also asked the question, and I'm not sure whether it's for this uh, time or maybe by email, but certainly a number of people have said, Stephen and Simon, you know, would you be able to give your thoughts about suitable tools and platforms for automated DPIAs? Uh, and uh, I think maybe we may be able to uh, answer that offline and then the the other questions we were getting were in the in the paper world uh, do we think who do we think are the regulators that have produced the, the most helpful guidance on DPIAs do we think it's the Keneal or is it the, the data protection commissioner in Ireland or the ICO I don't know whether you, you guys have got any thoughts I think just picking up the software part first of all and Robert I, I think um, the software tools can be very very helpful um, in the ways that Stephen's described quite a bit actually um, uh, you know around being able to build it into a framework and to be able to kind of um, be able to show all of the DPIAs that you have be able to record them and to have a systematic way of tackling it and to record the information to record the you know the outcomes and to be able to track progress all of those kind of things that you would have and build that along the line of a, a framework and a risk matrix and all those kind of things so they, they can be very helpful 
from that point of view. Uh, but that doesn't mean that there's not a place for for using a standard, you know, word-based template or Excel-based template uh, for organisations that maybe don't have the budgets or the, you know, the time and energy to put in, or don't maybe do enough, you know, do enough DPIAs to to warrant the investment uh, in a software-based solution. Um, then a you know another template can you know can be can be very good uh, you know I've used such templates myself you know quite a lot. Uh, you just got to make sure that you're using the right set of questions. Um, in terms of those um, you know which regulators produce the best guidance, um, I'm not sure there's one particular one that I'm, I'm you know would say stands out above others for me. If I'm honest, uh, Stephen. Um, yeah, I mean I'd, I agree with what you say on on the software side of it. Um, I think. The, the, the pros and the pros for the online tool are really ease of use you know full auditability you can set alerts and triggers um with with, with some of them you can link link um different templates together so you can link it in with your lia process and you've got the data metric side of it so as i say you can you can look at the data behind it and try and spot trends and then you're sort of building in kind of assurance into your GDPR processes rather than being reactive um, but as you say you know on, on the con side there's an investment cost and I think a lot of DPOs do prefer a manual form because they're conscious the regulator might might, sit, might have to view that document um, um, so I think that needs to be considered you know on a organization by organization basis um, but I think as you say on the template side um, I mean, I think the ICO guidance is is useful because it it is they have got a standard template. Um, but I, I ultimately think, um, from a user friendly point of view, you you, you need to make a, your own bespoke version that suits your your organisation, and and also when you're using it, actually get feedback from the people that are going to use it and and tailor it. Be prepared to um, revisit it and improve it as time goes on. Because you will spot things where people go, I'm not sure what that means, or um, you'll spot trends in terms of nuances that that require tweaks to the form in practice. Yes, and and I and I just add that that in terms of the form, I recently saw a really interesting approach, which I'm sure is not the only one, but it's actually a three-part template that is part lawful grounds for processing or legitimate interest assessment, part DPIA and part privacy and ethics by design. Um, and you know yep. that that may be fantastic at the higher end of the scale, but then again you probably need to have simplified approaches to other parts of the business. Um, so I don't think there is a one size fits all approach. Anyway, look, um, thank you to um, you, Simon, and to Stephen, and um, to Dominic, who desperately wanted to take part but wasn't able to join us, and to my colleague, Nalisha, for patiently managing the technology in the background. We've overrun. Uh, we've had a huge number of people on the webinar, and there's still a good number of you there. I apologise that we didn't manage to cover all of the questions, but I think we pretty much touched on most of your concerns. I also apologise that there were some sound issues, but I imagine in this current climate, uh, bandwidth from time to time is an issue. But just to confirm, this will be uh, recording will be available. Uh, sometime later next week after the Easter holidays uh, in the UK. Um, we at Bristow's are going to be looking at uh, a webinar in May uh, on uh, medical regulatory changes uh, in the offing. Um, so from all of us, thank you. We look forward to being with you on another occasion. Thanks. Bye-bye.